Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Um, as more participants uh, trickle in, I just want to share, if you're here for Vault 110 pre-release webinar, you're in the right place. We welcome you and uh, thanks for taking the time to walk with us through the new functionality we have with this release. All right, before we get into the functionality itself, we'll walk through some basic goals and logistics. Happen, could you move me to the next slide, please? Thank you. All right, so the goal, as I mentioned, close to the title, uh, pre-release pre insights into Vault 110. And any questions you might have to help you prepare your teams for Vault 110, we'd like to be able to answer those. Uh, so just a couple of uh, quick logistic things uh, before we get started there. Um, you can put your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom. You're probably familiar with this. And the panelists will respond to your questions right away if it's a short response, or we'll get back to you asynchronously if there is a longer response warranted. I also want to point out that we are recording this session and uh, it will be shared only after um, Vault 110 is released. As you all know, this is a pre-release um, webinar and uh, we have about a week in our uh, planned timelines uh, for the release. All right, next slide, please. Here's where I'd like to introduce the agenda to you and also uh, some of us who are going to be speaking today. We have an introduction and kickoff for just about five minutes. Uh, Vinod, who is our senior director of the secure product line at HashiCorp is uh, available with us today to speak with us about uh, Vault in general and also give you a um, passage into how Vault 110 features and updates are panning out. Um, for the detailed uh, sections in terms of functionality, uh, I've got my teammate Harpin, uh, as well as myself, we both will be talking through the functionality. With that, I'll pass the buck over to Vinod. Vinod, would you Thank like to speak? Jen. Thank you. All right, so I have, I have five minutes, so I'm gonna um, try and keep this really short. Uh, we can move to the next slide, Harpin. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you all of you, first of all, again, th thanks for taking time to um, kind of walk with us through the preview for uh, Vault 110. Uh, what I thought I'll do here um, is, is to give you a little bit of kind of background insight into some of the process. How do we come up with the roadmap? Uh, and then also talk through some of the themes that we've identified for um, what you see here is FY23, but what we're talking about is the next um, 10 to 12 months. Um, so at the beginning of every year, we kind of start by planning and, and we did that this year as well, start to think about, hey, what's, what's really important to us, our customers, and then we identify some specific teams, because as you all kind of probably aware, Vault is a fairly feature rich kind of product. And as we get more and more entrenched in um, customer environments, we're also being asked to do many, many things, right? So um, one of the key parts of kind of product management here at HashiCorp is trying to not only know what to work on, but also what to what not to focus on, right? So that's why we, <clears throat> at the beginning of the year, we, we kind of have a, a really long exercise trying to understand what are some of the themes that we should be working on that are kind of gonna be very useful to our customers. Um, so this year, the themes that we had uh, kind of identified are what you're seeing on the screen. Um, secrets management is our core workflow. Most customers, many of you all use Vault for your secret management workflows. And um, I'd say this is, this is by far kind of considered the best in class product and all of that. But what we've also realized is that we want to continue to not only improve the functionality of secrets management, so being able to kind of continually improve uh, capabilities that we offer, but also uh, go back and look at the entire user experience of it, right? Um, so because of the nature of how Vault has been evolving over the last many years, 
Um, what we want to kind of focus on is to think about how you all are adopting it. And as champions within your own organizations, how can you help other application teams and adopt Vault in a simple, easy manner, right? So focusing on practitioner experiences, customer uh, administrator experiences, there's going to be a lot of effort that we put into that this year. Um, we'll also, and, and we are a security product, right? We realize that the reason that you all are using Vault is because of the strong security that it provides. So we'll be, we'll be also focusing, as we do every year, on improving the security posturing this year, working on things like FIPS certification for Vault itself. Um, the next big bucket is, again, Vault is being successful because not only the capabilities that it offers, but because it can work really well in different environments. So whether it's your on-prem data centers or on the cloud providers, whether you're using it with uh, a custom container service or with Kubernetes, um, whether you're work, using different identity service, uh, uh, whatever your identity uh, infrastructure is, that's where Vault's kind of uh, power comes from and its strength is, is its ecosystem. So this year we continue to not only improve again, the scale of the ecosystem, try more integrations and things like that, but also improve the overall plugin experience itself. So this is, this is kind of a ground up work that we've identified and, and we'll be putting a lot of effort into making that plugin experience be very, very simple and easy to use as well. Um, in addition, kind of Vault's been used, like I said, for secrets management, but uh, there are customers who use us for uh, other workflows like PKI and key management. Uh, these are can have kind of evolved over a period of time. We've made constant improvements. This year, there's going to be a focus. Um, Harpin, who's PM here, is going to take kind of um, a grounds up approach in identifying how these use cases are today. How do we improve them in terms of both, again, capabilities and user experiences? Um, and the, the fourth bucket that you see there, we're calling it uh, driving Vault adoption to scale. And that's really about all, all of you. Uh, you've been using Vault for a while. And as you're continuing, and we're seeing this happen over and over where customers start with like, a small application set have grown 10x in the last two, three years, right? And, and what does that mean for Vault itself? And uh, what, what we're doing here this year is to focus on the scalability, uh, performance, reliability, resiliency of Vault, which is, which is absolutely, as someone who's running, and maintaining, and manage Vault, uh, those are things that are going to be very, very critical for you. So we'll, we'll be working on um, the critical underlying infrastructure like storage um, and, and uh, identity and other things like that. Last bucket you see here is uh, HashiCorp as a whole has kind of identified cloud as a growth opportunity and for us to start providing our products as cloud services. Um, but what's even more, and, and HCP Vault um, was recently made available last year. We're continuing to kind of improve that experience and offer kind of that as a first class product delivery method. So we can have new customers or onboarding start on HCP Vault with us. But what, I've, what, is, what is even more exciting is that for on-prem customers, customers who also deployed Vault and are running it in their own data centers, the transition to the cloud really offers a few other things. We can now build value add services on our cloud platform that even our self-managed customers can use. So we'll be exploring a few of those this year. We'll be kind of uh, hoping to work on it and release kind of some of those by the second half of this year as well. And then lastly, kind of what is having a cloud uh, uh, kind of um, delivery method mean for us? It means that we'll be able to release features faster, which means it improves kind of the, the, the quality of even the on-prem releases, the, the, the releases that you're used to that comes out once every four months. We now will be able to provide more kind of um, higher quality, higher stability releases because we're, we will be able to release them on cloud earlier, be able to do some additional beta testing. So a lot of benefits for from the transition to the cloud, even to our um, self-managed and on-prem customers. So we're very, very excited for what's to come this year and, and kind of Vault 110, which we'll, we'll see a lot about falls under a lot of these different buckets. So with that, I'll pass it off to um, Harpin. 
Cool. Thank you, Vinod. Yeah, we are very excited to be able to walk you through the one to 10 release features. It's a pretty big release and the team worked really hard on it. So quick disclaimer, um, you know, it covers the features that will be part of all release 1.10. Um, you know, we can change things again if we need to, but we don't see it happening. Uh, but yes, so we're just kind of excited. Everything we publish here, um, there will be resources, documentation, FAQs, et cetera, published after the fact as well. So you don't need to like scratch down notes or, or uh, try to, you know, take it down on your own documentation side. We want you to sit back, enjoy the show uh, and just listen. And we can answer questions if you raise them in the chat, as Pusha mentioned. Uh, and all of this content will be published after for you to digest and review in your own time. Well, cool. so the first thing that we, we wanted to get to was MFA support. Um, so for those who are aware, MFA is kind of a strong table stake security consideration for all Vault users and kind of for security products in general at this point. Uh, so prior to 1.10, MFA was available as an enterprise feature. Um, and so with 1.10, kind of like to demonstrate our, our thought leadership and our kind of grassroots as an open source product or our legacy. Um, we're introducing support for MFA in Vault OSS. Um, so users can now actually apply MFA policies via the API and the CLI uh, with open source Vault. The enterprise license will still be needed to upgrade MFA to access more sensitive resources in Vault. Um, and so that includes the version of MFA that will be used with ACL and Sentinel policies. Uh, but with this OSS version, um, you'll get the login workflow, uh, all MFA methods are supported. There are new endpoints for that. Um, and this MFA version is namespace aware. Um, so to clarify in open source, all the endpoints uh, operate in the root namespace. Uh, but with login MFA, you can configure methods and configurations in individual namespaces. Um, and those configurations will be available in the child namespaces. So kind of in summary, there are now multiple login methods um, in, uh, you know, Vault MFA, um, but we'll be publishing an infographic to kind of show you the three different ones that you have. Um, and uh, you can review it as you see fit. But net net, we're really excited to have some open source MFA available in the product. Uh, we really are an open source company first and foremost. And so we kind of like to constantly renew our commitment to that. Well, so next we have server side consistent tokens. So just sort of a quick reminder for anyone who uses DR or proof replication, um, Vault uses an eventually consistent replication model. Um, and so we actually kind of noticed a few releases ago um, that this precludes read after write semantics when clients interact with perf standbys or clusters. And that was effectively leading to permission denied errors sometimes when interacting with performance clusters. Um, so in 1.7, we added some mitigation for this. I'm looking at, yeah, we added some um, mitigations for this, uh, but it required the end user putting a new HTTP header on the request um, or using the agent. And so in 1.10, we're kind of trying to solve this on the server side. So that way the client doesn't actually have to do the work to get around that permission error. Um, so we're putting the relevant minimum write ahead log state onto the actual service tokens that are generated on the server side. Um, so what does this mean? Um, so while we're changing the format of tokens, they're still backwards compatible with pre 1.10. So the net takeaway for you is that your old tokens will be fine. You have backwards compatibility. Nothing is going to break on you or disrupt your architecture. Uh, but now we're adding the ability um, to sort of actually have that server side consistency guaranteed by your server side tokens instead of you having to solve it entirely uh, as the end user. Um, and so I think, you know, historically we have also seen customers resolving this with the agent controlled consistency function, uh, but that requires both agent. Uh, and so kind of, you know, really the, the hope here um, is that now the client header will be able to solve this consistency challenge and you, um, you know, are actually doing less work and Vault is making your DR, your perf replication experience uh, a lot simpler. Cool. So we've been investing in clients uh, a lot over the past few releases, specifically client counting. Um, so quick review of a client definition, uh, because there's lots of entities and concepts in Vault, and so I think it's worth a refresher. Uh, Vault clients are 
unique applications or users over our particular billing period. Um, so it's used to track vault consumption, and they're both a summation of non-active and active identity clients. And, and 1.9, you know, we introduced some changes uh, to really improve this experience. So in particular, we changed non-entity token counting logic to dedupe non-entity tokens. Non-entity tokens are now counted on access rather than on creation. And we also added functionality to display these clients per namespace in the UI. And so 1.10 actually sees our renewed and continued commitment um, to the client count experience. So in 1.10, we now added the ability to view clients per auth mount in the UI and in the CLI. Uh, and we're also showing counts uh, month per month in the API, and we'll have it in the UI and the upcoming release. Um, so you'll be able to see changes to clients over time in both the UI and the CLI. And we've added new FAQs and UI improvements on client counting. And we are also constantly improving and committing. There will be more work done on client counting in future releases. So if you have experiences, you know, please talk to your account rep. Please ask questions in the chat. If you've noticed anything with client counts that you'd like to see um, that you haven't seen addressed, please bring it up. Hopefully it's on a roadmap already and hopefully you enjoy kind of what we've delivered in 1.9 and what we'll be delivering in 1.10. And as I mentioned, there will be new FAQs, new documentation uh, explaining all of these changes. So we're very excited about this next feature. Um, so we've been asked pretty actively for the ability to reorganize namespaces within Vault. Uh, and so we're pretty pumped to be delivering it in 1.10. This is particularly relevant when migrating from, say, a, a single node to a multi-node cluster. So a typical situation for that is an OSS to enterprise upgrade, um, or if customers are just upgrading to use namespaces. Um, and so currently, customers have to manually recreate namespaces from scratch, um, even in situations as minor as when, say, uh, you're a customer and you have a namespace per organizational unit in your business and your organizational unit just changes names. Uh, that's really frustrating to have to actually recreate parity with your vault namespace breakdown. Um, and so we're aware of that problem and we wanted to give you a pretty, you know, seamless workflow around it. Uh, and so in 1.10, we're introducing the ability to move mounts from one location to another at the mount level, not just the namespace level. Um, we're hoping this kind of provides the granularity that you need to solve issues like the one that I mentioned before about migrating from those uh, more naive to more complex situations. This will be available in both the UI and the CLI. Um, so all roles and configurations associated with the mount are preserved. Identity entities and aliases are not, so those will need to be created, uh, and all leases will be expired upon moving, and new policies may need to be applied. But overall, we really, really uh, see a lot of usage out of namespaces, um, and we were really aware of, you know, the migration situations and considerations for them. And so we really just wanted to support namespace usage and uh, deliver this feature that, that we think is kind of essential um, to y'all's journey. Cool, so next we have the KV Secret Zero Knowledge Patch. So if anyone paid attention to 1.9, you probably saw that we released some functionality around this. It was in kind of a tech preview, but I'm really excited to be delivering it uh, and the team is delivering it in 1.10. Um, so very high level, um, why do you need something like a Zero Knowledge Patch? Well, so there are a number of vault environments where customers have created policies that make it really difficult to update a KVV2 value without reprivileges. Um, so like, let's take, for example, you have an application um, that's really just looking for in injecting. It's looking to inject uh, values to KVV2. Um, but you don't want it to do anything other than inject new values or get the version numbers out. Um, and you know there aren't really ACLs to support that very specific workflow nicely. 1.9 added a patch feature to update those values without read privilege. So you could update a value in KVV2 without having read privilege on all of the actual values uh, at that key. Now in 1.10, you can also see version and key counts fully without still having the read ability on all of those 
values. So that's the zero knowledge part of zero knowledge patch. You can patch, aka write a new value to KVV2, um, and you can see how many versions there are and how many keys there are, but you don't actually have full knowledge of what the values at that particular key is. It sort of gives you an explicit role for this write new values and read counts, but don't read values themselves exclusive workflow. Um, it's bespoke, but I think the, the feedback that we've kind of seen from everyone is if you hit the situation, you really love this feature. Like if, if you've hit this pain point, um, you know exactly the value of this and what it's doing for you. Um, and so if you find yourself doing strange ACL gymnastics um, around sensitive usage of KVV2 across different roles, um, we're really excited to be able to kind of scratch that itch and, and give you this unique workflow. Cool. So this is also another feature kind of like Mount Move that has been pretty in demand for a while. Uh, and we're, we're pretty pumped to be able to deliver it to you. So the basic motivation is this. You have customers who are running Vault in particularly sensitive environments or who are beholden to particularly restrictive compliance regulations. Um, these you know, conservative usage profiles often rely on external hardware security modules or HSMs. Um, for anyone who's unaware of HSMs, imagine this really extra secure physical box that generates and stores your cryptographic primitives like your keys and it makes your auditor really happy with you. Um, Vault has this historical paradigm for integrating with these HSMs. You know, we have features like seal wrap and auto unseal and entropy augmentation, uh, but they haven't existed for PKI workflows really until now. So in Vault 1.10, we added the ability to configure a PKI secrets engine mount with an HSM backed key. Uh, so the functional result is that you may now spin up a PKI mount. Um, and if you have an HSM configured with Vault, the root private key and all of the operations that require it, um, so generating that key, signing and verifying with that key, uh, they're all now performed in and by the HSM. Um, so that's awesome, and we are really proud to be delivering this. Uh, but in addition to that, when we were actually implementing this, we realized that the interface that we wrote uh, to utilize an HSM key for PKI is pretty extensible. And um, we thought, well, you know, kind of what else can we do with this? Can we can we look at other key sources? Um, and to that end, we actually realized that we could provide this support for cloud providers. Um, so in addition to what I just showed you and, and mentioned to you about having an HSM backing all of the PKI workflows, um, we're adding the ability to have cloud key providers provide the key for the workflows. Um, so that means in 1.10, you can do this exact same functionality, but with cloud KMS. You can back a key mount with an external private key, um, and that external private key happens to live in Azure Key Vault or Amazon KMS and we'll be supporting actually Google Cloud as well uh, and 1.11. So hopefully this allows you to have more prescriptive ownership and over the workflows of your keys and, and their stewardship and where they live. Uh, and you know, as Vinod mentioned, really kind of helps us on this journey um, this year down making PKI a better experience and a more first class experience in Vault. Finally, uh, in the world of key management, it's sort of good practice to occasionally rotate your keys. So there are, are two reasons for this. Um, for anyone who's sort of aware of encryption key hygiene, uh, if you use an encryption key too many times, you can be uh, at risk for a nonce reuse attack. Um, and also in general, if you rotate your keys a lot, it minimizes the blast radius in the event of a particular key compromise. Um, so prior to 1.10, there was actually no way to configure Vault to automatically rotate the keys uh, for any user-generated key. Um, so we had, for example, Vault auto-rotates its own cryptographic barrier key, um, but not ones that you as the user create and have control over. Uh, so to solve for this, we introduced auto rotation for the transit and transform tokenization secrets engines. So rather than asking you as a customer to say, define the number of say encryption operations uh, that you want to happen before a key gets rotated, we're doing this based on time. Um, so now on your transit keys and on your transform tokenization keys, there is a time interval field uh, and you can specify how much time you would like to pass before Vault rotates that key for you. Um, so if you put zero, then the key will not be auto-rotated 
Uh, and let's say if you put like 30 days, then every 30 days, the key will be rotated. Um, so hopefully that allows y'all to, you know, better adhere to whatever encryption key management hygiene practices that your org or your own sensibilities kind of, uh, kind of dictate for you. Cool. And another thing here uh, for anyone unaware, so FIPS is a federally maintained standard that dictates, among other things, how secure cryptography should be performed and implemented. Um, so historically, the way that we've allowed customers to obtain FIPS compliance is actually by using HSMs, those boxes that we talked about before, with our seal wrap feature, uh, which effectively extends the cryptography of that HSM to vaults cryptographic primitives. Um, so while this is effective and we see a lot of customers achieving FIPS compliance with it, uh, HSMs are kind of expensive uh, and they can be difficult to manage and they're not performant for everyone's use cases. So we really wanted to deliver a, a method that is native to Vault itself that can give you FIPS cryptography, um, similar guarantees, but you don't have to pay for or operate um, an HSM. So we are very beyond excited to be releasing a FIPS version of Vault. Um, what does this mean? In short, it's a separate binary. Uh, it is compiled using a different cryptographic library that already has FIPS certification, and it changes the experience. So to you as the end user, Vault looks the same, but under the hood, the cryptography is basically FIPS validated. Um, so one note is there are external dependencies to the creation of this binary. So because of that, um, it will be based off of 1.10, but it will be released slightly later, uh, May 20th. And if FIPS compliance and compliance in general are complicated and a bit overwhelming, um, the net net is, uh, this is a, a different version of Vault, not a better version of Vault. Um, and you know, if, if you have an auditor or compliance regulations on your side of the house, um, feel free to talk to your account rep, talk to us, and we can tell you if FIPS certification is something that might be important to you. But most people who know they need FIPS validated cryptography are uh, currently being told that pretty actively by an auditor. Um, so if this does not apply to you, don't freak yourself out. It might just not apply to you. Um, I think with that, I'm actually gonna stop and me and Pusha are gonna do a, a hot swap on the mic here. Thank you, Harpin. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen to the right slide. All right, and there we go. Hey everybody, I am back. I uh, did a little bit of the intros earlier. This is Pushya, one of the product managers on Vault. And uh, I'll continue on with some of the functionality that's coming in with Vault 110. One of them is Vault as an OIDC identity provider. This is generally available along with PKC, PKCE support. Uh, as of 110. And uh, you might remember that in 19, this was a tech preview functionality. So it's mainly about delegating authentication. What we've been noticing is enterprises use a diverse set of IDPs and uh, Vault is in a good place that it covers uh, most of the well-known IDPs for authentication methods. Now, when your developers are writing custom applications, it can get time consuming to support many authentication methods. But in fact, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Wall can act as the OIDC provider. So applications can basically leverage the user's already existing vault identity and allow for delegated authentication into the app. We have a um, logo that might be familiar to you here uh, from Boundary. It's one of our other products. We have it in here because uh, that's where the idea originally started. Um, since we have a portfolio of different products where we realized Boundary could also not have to reinvent the wheel and um, use the delegated authentication through Vault. So if you're thinking about bridging provider information, OIDC, you can think about Vault in those terms now. This next one is about the Vault console secrets engine. We have some enhancements coming in with 110. 
uh, we realized that enterprises rely on Vault and console working together to achieve zero trust security posture for you. So with this release, we have a little bit closer of a integration between Vault console secrets engine with Vault, uh, sorry, with, with console. And how that's going to happen is console ACL tokens uh, that are console namespace aware will be available now. And also the ability to generate Vault tokens with console, whether you're going with the role, node, or service identity, this will be possible. This next one is about DB2 credential management. Now DB2 does not have the concept of DB users in itself, but it relies on the underlying OS um, user to grant permission to the DB instances, which is running on that machine. So utilizing what IBM supports as the LDAP security plugin and the open LDAP engine that we have with Vault, uh, the DBT users can now delegate authentication and authorization like a group membership to Vault. This can be uh, really important to you if you have been using uh, DB2 for a very long time, it can be a very important part of your uh, business workflows. It's, um, it's one large um, database that has uh, survived many decades and it becomes very crucial to the business. And so we wanna be able to meet you where you need uh, credential management at the DB2 level as well. And this is our solution for it. This next one is about what we call plugin multiplexing. So the way things have been working so far until 1.9 release um, are that you have external plugins, especially database plugins, uh, you're running them and there is a plugin process one-on-one -on -one per database config. Um, and this can lead to a lot of resource consumption. Let me just take an example here. If you had 10 Oracle DB configs, um, there's a little bit of a spike in memory there. And if you were using 100 DB configs with Oracle, it starts spiking up. And imagine if you were to use tens of thousands of DB configs uh, in your deployment, the scale really starts to affect your uh, memory consumption. So what we figured out would work better is what if you had a multiplexing scenario here? There's one plugin process that allows for a connection across uh, different DB configs. There's a multi multiplex client uh, that will take care of that connection to the process. And as a result, there is scope for reducing burden on your machines. Let's see how that looks. Um, just for uh, Simple test purposes, we started with a 10 uh, DB config scenario. Just like earlier, there might not be a big spike there. You start noticing there's not a big spike even when you have 100 DB configs. But what comes close is uh, we took six different DB instances and spread it across um, 350 DB configs per. And that's when you start noticing something that used to be like 100. DB config. So in, in a sense, um, you're able to get to a 20x scale with the same amount of memory consumption. Um, and you can imagine how much better this can be for your overall um, connections for a larger scale. Now, I want to point out we're talking mostly through Oracle with 110 because that's what's uh, happening in 110. We are working on the we are releasing the multiplexing uh, portion for Oracle DBs alone. But this is our chance to expand in the future releases into other DBs and other external plugins over time. I'll talk a little bit about Vault Agent. This is a community PR that we received and, and it uh, addressed a very important problem that we have been hearing. Um, 
customers want to monitor their vault agent, health checks, um, what has succeeded, what failed. I want to understand how much uh, performance uh, metrics are at play. And this information has been lacking until one line. Um, what we have now is a, an introductory set of metrics that were uh, absorbed through this PR. And as a result, you can compare those uh, to the runtime metrics you may have seen. What you have as a result is a few runtime oriented metrics for your agent, if you will. Um, you have some of these other metrics on the left side uh, of the screen that are already available and you will see them on our documentation. These are the new metrics on the right side that you can start collecting now and you have a uh, better sense uh, with this knowledge of how your agent is performing. All right, the next one is about a Vault Lambda extension. Um, if you have been using AWS, you would know uh, Lambda is a serverless environment. It lets you run code without provisioning and managing servers. Um, and Lambda functions perform processing when you need it. Now you can leverage Vault secrets through the Vault Lambda extension. Um, so far, the AWS Lambda function that uses the Lambda extension to authenticate with Vault, it receives the database credential and it performs the necessary function, but there hasn't been caching in so far. With this capability, caching would be possible so you can prevent proxying every call. So this is helpful to not strain your resources uh, when you have high rates of calls and is expected to improve performance. It would also be able to give you uh, setting expiry times uh, and handle rotation of keys, allow manual um, invalidation of the cache whenever you need to. Um, and once again, this was a community PR, uh, just like the previous agent telemetry one. And we appreciate the community involvement, uh, the extent to which we are able to uh, connect with the community uh, through these PRs and leverage um, good quality uh, information as well as code go into Vault. That's something we appreciate a lot. This, uh, um, I was gonna say last topic, but I think we have one more after that. Um, so this topic is about Terraform provider for Vault. Uh, if you have been using this, I have some good news. Um, I'll start at a high level. I want to share the amount of effort and accomplishment uh, that's coming with it going into Terraform Provider for Vault these past few months. Uh, as you all know, it does not follow the same uh, release cadence as Vault itself. It's more frequent. It's about monthly um, whenever we have a good chunk of uh, deliverables uh, to move forward with. Um, increasingly, we're noticing that customers want to use the provider in all kinds of configuration on Vault. And you might not always have the resources or the data sources, the parameters in place for the provider uh, to be leveraged to its full extent. So what we have been doing these past few months is develop consistent momentum. So we keep up with the net new features that we're adding so they can be configured through the Terraform provider as well. And at the same time, look deeper into continually reducing that feature gap from the past. So I will mention two of these uh, features at a high level um, beyond a lot of um, resources and data sources that have been added over these past few months. The first one is an enhanced namespace support. And this is open to trial for a few more weeks and uh, we will be um, merging things for good. Um, the problem we've uh, seen is that as of today, the world resources or data sources that are being provisioned in the namespaces, um, they make for a disjointed 
workflow and uh, there is complexity at a larger scale. With that, we are unable to uh, provide the right kind of experience for the operator, but with this solution, we can make it uh, so that what namespaces um, the resources can fit in in a more relative form to the provider's configured namespace. Um, each of these namespaces um, can be created as part of the same Terraform execution, so you don't have to um, do 10 things before you have to shave the yak. And all the dependent resources will be created within that namespace itself. So we expect this to help your workflow as you work through um, using namespaces in the context of provider. This next one is uh, on KMIPS Secrets Engine. We're supporting KMIPS Secrets Engine to be configured through the Terraform provider for Vault. This will be uh, part of this upcoming release as well. Um, it is the release that's pretty much in line with the Vault 110, which is why I uh, have included this section into this presentation. All right, so that's about Terraform provider for Vault. We're coming up on the last topic, which is Vault feature deprecation and plans. This is a list of all of the features that have been announced for deprecation in the past few releases, past many releases, in fact, but we're building a cadence in terms of the end of support and the feature removal into the future. So please take a look at these. Uh, uh, functionality. You will also see this um, on our documentation pages. You will notice that if any of these features are um, coming up on deprecation or end of support and you have been using them, there is a considerable amount of information for you to look at the path forward for you. All right, so that's everything we had for the Vault 110 pre-release webinar today. I will um, stop sharing screen for a moment and uh, see what our next steps are. Thanks, Pusha. I think there were a couple um, questions that were answered um, in the Q&A box, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll wait a couple more minutes to see if anyone has any further questions before we wrap. All right, I think uh, we have covered all of the questions as you mentioned, Kaylee. Thank you all once again for taking the time to um, walk through the functionality of Vault 110. We really appreciate your time and uh, we're excited for you to start using Vault 110.